Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Roselli, uh, direct, Surgical Director of the Aorta Center, and I'm here with uh, my colleagues, um, who I'll have introduced in just a second. But we want to have a discussion for patients who have the diagnosis of aortic dissection uh, and, and allow an opportunity to, to share some of our thoughts and answer some of your questions about this uh, difficult diagnosis in this uh, vlog this video discussion. Scott, you want to introduce yourself? Tell us. Hi there, my name is Scott Cameron. I'm a vascular medicine physician and cardiologist and I serve as section head um, of vascular medicine. So I'm interested in research and um, Dr. Lyne and I have federal funding to study aortic disease and um, we truly are a multidisciplinary team. Sean? So, Sean Lydon, I'm the chairman of vascular surgery. I had been the, the vascular and endovascular director of the aortic center. I just handed those reins over to, to one of our, our new colleagues, uh, Frank Caputo, but I'm also happy to be here and show how we work well together. And doc, we let Dr. Desai show up today, too. I am uh, Melinda Desai. I'm the medical director of the aorta center. I am a cardiologist. And I'm also director of clinical operations for the department within uh, of cardiovascular medicine. And somehow you found time to join us. And this is good. Yes, yeah, it yeah. Is. would not miss it for uh, anything else. Fantastic. So. Um, I'm going to ask you, Dr. Desai, to address just a simple question about um, what is a dissection and, and how do you differentiate it from uh, an aneurysm or, or what is the connection there? Those diagnoses often come together. Yes. Yes, they are, they are, they come together. Thanks, Eric. Uh, so what is an aortic aneurysm? A aortic aneurysm is where the aorta, which is the big blood vessel that uh, emerges out of the heart and supplies blood to the rest of the body. When the wall of the aorta, because of whatever reason, be it a genetic predisposition or some, some other attribution, it gets thinned out, it is, it expands, uh, it is not able to sustain the, the pressure of the blood coming out, and it basically balloons out. Uh, that, is, uh, that is called an aortic aneurysm. Once it reaches a certain threshold, uh, five centimeter, then that's when it is called an aortic, di aortic uh, aneurysm. Now, as a balloon, if you keep stretching the wall uh, at some point of time, there will be, it is not gonna be able to sustain the pressure. And then uh, portions of the wall may tear and then the blood may enter from the lumen or the central cavity into the wall and essentially create two, uh, separate the layers of the aortic wall. That essentially defines uh, dissection. A rupture is a continuum as it sounds as ominous as it is, where if, the, if all the layers uh, are breached and the blood uh, uh, exits outside the cavity into the chest cavity, then that's essentially uh, aortic rupture. So aneurysm, dissection, and uh, rupture, that's sort of in a continuum, uh, but aneurysm is uh, where you have a dilate, dilation of the aorta. The other one is where there's a breach in the wall, and the third one is, it is catastrophe. Right. So they're clearly, they, they clearly are tied together. So when the aneurysm is when the vessel stretched out, the layers can start to split, and that's the dissection. But not all dissections are necessarily related to aneurysms, are they, Scott? There's probably, or certainly there is, another or a whole bunch of series of different disease processes that are occurring at a microscopic level in the wall of the aorta. You and I both have research labs that are focusing on trying to understand this better. Um, can you tell us a little bit what are the causes of these problems? Yeah, so it's a great question, Dr. Roselli. I mean, sometimes um, there are syndromes, we call them aortic, acute aortic syndromes. So a patient, for example, may have hardening of the artery, atherosclerosis, and they can have a little bit of erosion of one of those narrowed plaques in the aorta. And if that erodes deeply enough, um, sometimes the patients will have acute chest pain and it can feel like an aortic dissection, but it's a slightly different process. As you said, it's disease of the inner layer of the blood vessel. And patients that have um, damage to the blood vessel, an ulcer, um, for want of a better word, um, sometimes have abnormally high cholesterol. 
um, it would be not unusual for us to see those patients in clinic and actually diagnose them with a genetic disorder whereby they're making too much cholesterol or they cannot clear that cholesterol. So a patient may come to the Cleveland Clinic and have pain and they may have an imaging finding, but what we often find is that by comprehensive care and by communicating back and forth very effectively, we can often find two or three medical reasons that actually got them into that situation in the first place. And you know, atherosclerosis is one of them, but certainly as you alluded to, genetic disorders of blood vessels, particularly those that affect the aorta, is certainly another consideration. And I think generates a lot of undue anxiety for patients as well as their families. So the atherosclerotic disease process is where we get these penetrating ulcers. I think ulcers are actually a good description of it when we see in the operating room, right, Sean? Um, the, the ulceration process is one thing. That typically happens in older patients, not necessarily, but mostly in older patients. Um, but our younger population or middle-aged population, it's often uh, uh, some, what we're learning is more and more now, are genetically triggered um, uh, an error in the ability of the aorta to maintain its integrity. And sometimes we'll see dissections at even smaller sizes. Sean, we see a lot of those and we get called on in the middle of the night and we have to make a plan together about how to take care of them. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what's the treatment for aortic dissection? So I think we sort of look at it where the location is. And so if it's close to the heart or if it comes off uh, before the artery to the left arm, the risk is that that tear can propagate towards the heart and and leak into the cavity that the heart sits in or the pericardium of that bag. and Or it can tear down to where the heart arteries are and lead to lack of flow to the heart. And so the heart can die. And so those are called type A dissections. And those are really need to be repaired as soon as found. Uh, the second type is where it happens distal to the left arm artery. And those are called type B. Those so you mean like downstream? Downstream right? or down towards the leg. So, so coming from the left arm artery down where the aorta ends at, at the belly button. And so those are originally helped by lowering the blood pressure and so taking some of the pressure off the wall. But we found that many of those patients can be relined from the inside to sort of like put an inner tube within the aorta to cover over where that entry tear a hole is to try and reline it and get it back to normal size. And so we look at it, whether it's close to the heart or farther away from the heart, we treat both, but the timing of when we do it is a little bit different, whereas it's much, much sooner when it's closer to the heart and it may be a little bit more delayed if it's further away from the heart. And that's really because we've continued to study how best to treat these patients and who best to treat. And then there's patients where it involves the whole thing where it may have a little bit of both, an early repair and then a late repair down, down the road. Yeah, one of the things I think, um, the message I often will tell my patients is even if the dissection, the layers coming apart, is involving the downstream part of the aorta and we've either opted to treat it with you know, really strict blood pressure control, medical therapy, or as you mentioned now, we're more often putting the devices in to reline things because we've had real good success with that. Um, the substrate of that aorta, even the parts that aren't dissected are probably vulnerable because we, we were talking about there's something going on at a, at a microscopic level. So we've got to follow all these patients. I think one of the things that's hard for patients to grasp when they're in the sort of the, the chaos of everything that's happening with the acute aortic syndrome process you were talking about, Dr. Cameron, is um, kind of understanding uh, what, what's next. And so I think an important message that we have to send, and it's a question that's come through from, from Betsy's office through our patient uh, um, and nurse-directed patient education office, is if I've had something taken care of in one part of my aorta, is the rest of my aorta at risk? The answer is pretty much yeah. I, I think we all have to sort of feel that, yes, the answer is yes. Um, specifically, uh, how much at risk and when at risk really depends on some of the very specific things that we're seeing based on imaging studies, cross-sectional, what we call cross-sectional imaging studies, which are CAT scan or MRI. Malin, can you talk to a, little, a little bit about that, about kind of how we manage a patient after we've gotten them through the acute phase of either an open surgery for the upstream aorta, what we call type A repair with one of the cardiac surgery team or a downstream repair with the vascular surgery or cardiac surgery team, or you know, we work together in unison to manage all that. Then what do we do? What's next? 
So thanks. Uh, so like Eric said, it is, you know, the initial insult and the initial operation to f initial procedure to fix this insult is just the beginning of a long-term relationship uh, with your aortic expert. Essentially, uh, at that time, depending upon where the insult was and what kind of an operation uh, or a procedure you had, that helps dictate long-term follow-up plan in terms of imaging. Uh, if you have an endovascular stent graft that requires a different type of imaging at different type time intervals, if you have a surgical graft, it requires different type of uh, imaging at different time intervals. Now, as Dr. Roselli alluded to, it is absolutely crucial to have precise tomographic imaging, so either a contrast enhanced CT scan or MRI uh, of your aortic vasculature to help not only establish a baseline, but have serial follow-up at various time points to make sure everything is stable, make sure things are regressing appropriately, and sure as heck make sure things are not progressing at an alarming rate to a point where we need to do something. Additionally, especially in the early part of disease manifestation, we have to make sure there's no post-procedural complication at the operation site. It could be infection. It could be a, a weakness at the junction, which results in something called a pseudoaneurysm. Uh, various things. So bottom line is imaging, having a plan, having a follow-up plan and having an imaging plan are absolutely crucial. Uh, and as Dr. Rosalie alluded to, this is essentially a lifelong disease that requires a lifelong plan. This is sort of 401A. Uh, like you have your 401K for retirement, this is your 401A. You need a long-term plan. 401A order? 401A order. I like that. There you That's go. Good. That's good. And it really requires a multidisciplinary team like the one we have sitting here, doesn't it? So Sean, what do you think? after we treat someone, how often do you think we have to go back and, and touch things up or add a repair? I mean, I guess it, it's... So, you know, it depends. If you were the abdominal aorta, we know that at five years, about 10 or 15% of people will develop an aneurysm in their chest. And so the current guidelines suggest if you've had the, the aorta and the belly fixed that you go and look here at least every three to five years. If it starts in the chest, it's actually much, much more likely that you develop in other places and well as you might have it in other locations like your brain or other things. And so it's really the coordination of the multidisciplinary team to sit there and say, where was your original problem? Do you have a problem with your tissues, the, the grist or connective tissue that holds us together that makes you more likely to have it? And then what pattern we might look for it to happen. And so if it's closer to the heart, the closer to the heart it gets, the more likely you'll have it in more places, the farther away from the heart the less likely it is. But the key is it really needs to be lifelong care, coordinating your blood pressure control and how often you get imaging and having someone who can reassess, is your repair okay? And are the areas that haven't been repaired degenerating? And so I think that's why you really wanna be with an expert who feels very comfortable in seeing these types of patients and works as a team because we don't all know each part of it as well as, as we do as a group. Yeah, I think I like, I like the way you, you describe that location sort of uh, and coordinates uh, with the sort of association of risk. Um, someone we don't have uh, sitting with us today, but uh, part of our team that's really critical is our clinical genetics team. Um, and so, um, you know, we were very commonly have, especially aortic dissection in patients with thoracic aortic disease, where there tends to be a stronger association with, with genetics as part of the cause, if not the, the very clear cause. Um, we have them evaluate most of our patients. And what's, what's been interesting is we're learning so fast that um, even if we've had someone screened for genetics, you know, five or, five or more years ago, they often need an additional screening study um, to update the genetics, right? Because now we're, we're screening for um, a panels of up to 35 genes, right, from the, the latest Invite panel. Yeah. And, and we are expanding that with our newer upcoming initiative into a lot more uh, over a full spectrum of cardiovas cardiovascular disease. So you are absolutely right. I think, you know, the bottom line is it is not a one-time deal. This is 
a start of a long-term relationship. Uh, and, and you have to stay true to yourself every time that patient comes in. Have you looked at today's images? Have you compared them to previous images? Have you, you know, is it just slowly growing just enough that, you know, if you compare the image from today to three years from a, uh, now, of three years prior, you know, is there a substantial increase? And like Eric mentioned, genetics, you know, it is rapidly evolving. So what you heard five years ago, I mean, if you have a definitive mutation, it's one thing, but if you were told five years ago you are negative or you have a variant of uncertain significance, then it is absolutely worth your while to have a revisit. Yeah, uh, I, just, I just had a patient who had a variant of unknown significance change just in the last year. They just called him back. It's really cool. Scott, Scott, what do you tell them, um, your patients about getting family members tested or family members evaluated? So that, that's a great question, and part of it depends on um, if the patient has a mutation that I know has predictable heritability. And so certain um, mutations in genes that go into the proteins in the blood vessel wall, um, some of those you have a 50% chance of inheriting them. In fact, I had a patient like that. Um, just a few months ago, and based on this particular genetic test, I told them, you know, you have a one in two chance of passing this on. Do you have any children? And this patient did, and um, asked me to to see their 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 child. And it turned out as adolescent um, also had that gene. And and what was a, a good example uh, with this particular patient is this patient came to us already having known. Um, I've got a little tear in a blood vessel and I probably need surgery, but then the, the person's child, on the other hand, had absolutely no symptoms, but in fact did have an enlarged aorta. And that presents an opportunity to try and correct something. And so my surgical colleagues, of course, I'm sure they would prefer to perform surgeries, not always in an emergency, uh, where the environment is maybe a little bit less controlled. And um, I, I think the difficulty is the genes of unknown significance. And certainly uh, we're learning more every day and, uh, and also they can overlap. Sometimes we find uh, blood vessel disorders in the head just based on noticing a blood vessel disorder in the aorta. So personalizing it to the patient is key. Yeah, that's a good point. The more we understand, the more, more precise we can be in, uh, in our plans for patients. Sean, one of the questions that we really commonly get from our patients after they've survived an aortic dissection is what can they do? You know, can they go back to work? Can they exercise? What kind of lifestyle modica modifications do they, do they have to implement in, you know, in, in, into their now survival chronic phase of life? So I think they can get back to activities, but really the key is what part of the aorta was damaged, what part of the aorta is repaired, what part of there is at risk, and really working with your care team to define what that risk is and then you know, participating in supervised exercise to make sure that you're maintaining a safe blood pressure, a safe heart rate, and that, you're, you know, that your team of physicians is helping coordinate when it's safe to do those activities. So if you still have untreated dissection or aneurysm, that is small or not causing problems with flow downstream and your blood pressure is low and your heart rate is low, then it may be safe to do more than if your blood pressure is very high. So it really is important that you work with your doctor to sort of understand that. But it is possible for patients to get back to activity. I think it's within reason. And so I don't think really, really, really strenuous activity makes sense. So I always tell people they're not going to be weightlifting. They're not going to be, you know, maybe doing a triathlon with some of these processes, but there are, depending on what their disease was, we do have a lot of professional athletes we've treated here at the clinic that have had ascending aortic aneurysm repairs that get back to playing professional sports. So I think it's really understanding where your problem was and then working with the team to make sure you're doing it safely and that there's ongoing checking that everything remains safe. Yeah, I, I like that answer. I mean, it, it, that's also a very much personalized thing. So many patients come in really scared to death. Someone told them, you know, don't lift more than 10 pounds. Uh, don't get constipated, honestly. <laughs> honestly. You know, it's, it's, it's um, poor patients sometimes are walking on eggshells. Um, they don't have to be. Um, once, once we know that, as you said, like blood pressure is key um, and getting to a point where we're happy with anatomy and, and what the aorta looks like, that's really critical. Um, and I think and it's an important message to send to patients. So 
And if you're having fear about what you've gone through, it's normal. So we studied this. We did a survey of a whole bunch of patients who survived type A aortic dissection. So they came in, you know, on a helicopter pad and went straight to having open surgery. Um, and, and we've done a subsequent survey and those results are being analyzed right now. And we tied them into to the patient record, which is really cool. But um, in both of those studies where we did the, um, the primary care physician PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder screening study, where we, you know, we asked them the four questions that, that are asked in that, that standard screening process, um, it was pretty remarkable to see that uh, nearly 50%, at least 45% of patients answered one of those questions positive. And those questions are like serious things that most people would say no to in a normal situation. And uh, nearly a quarter of the patients answered three out of four of those questions positive, which means they screened uh, positive for a PTSD and should have been referred to someone in the mental health field to help them deal with those PTSD issues. So, um, and a lot of these patients answered the questionnaire five, six, seven years after the event. So the fears that patients have about this are, are, are common. And it's okay that there's certain things that, you know, you're feeling if you're a patient who survived this, you're a family member who's kind of dealt with the long-term issues of it. Um, but know that there are dedicated teams that understand all aspects of your care from complex imaging to basic science research to genetics and to complex open endovascular surgical repair that work, can work together and also understand the emotional issues that are attached to all this to help you live a normal life and get back to it. Um, I, I think we probably should wrap things up and really appreciate the opportunity to sit down with you guys. Um, uh, as always, you know, we'll be talking probably in 10 minutes about a patient together, all of us in, in, in no time. And uh, thank you to the audience. Please contact us if you have any questions. We have lots of people here to help.